Russia was basically, you know, it's the money, honey. You know, if you can pay the money, show some money up front, the weapon is yours. Wow. They are they are brutally transactional, and they still are. By the way, you know, unlike other countries like the United States, I mean, it's unfair to compare the U.S. and Russia. Uh, when, it, when it comes to selling of weapons. In terms of the United States and the kind of protocols they go through in order to export weapons, even to a country like India, which is an ally, is crazy compared to how Russia exports weapons. Russia is like, Paisa hai, le lo, maal utha lo. It's, it's literally like that. I have met contractors, I have met middlemen, I have met agents, I've, I've seen the dark underbelly of the contracting system and I can tell you that it's as simple as that. The West is trying to make Putin out to be this international pariah, globally isolated, you know, almost on the lines of a Kim Jong-un. They want him to, the world to see him as a Kim Jong-un. Powerful, isolated, unpredictable, unreliable and dangerous. And someone who nobody should do business with. And then the Prime Minister of the world's largest democracy goes and hugs him at that time. He's hugged him before. Let's not forget Western hypocrisy here. Modi has hugged Putin many times before. He's gone on boat rides with him. He's gone to his farm. All that bromance has happened. But to hug him now, when the West is trying to make Putin out to be a Kim Jong-un, is it excruciating and aggravating for the West. But see the value for Russia. So my favorite, and uh, it's a controversial choice, but I'll qualify it. My favorite is the MiG-21. Ah. Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, it's an aircraft that has, uh, you know, that uh, triggers emotions in people because of the associations with it, whether it is... Uh, you know, Rangde Basanti or the Abhijit Gargil case, many, many tragic losses that India has suffered, uh, you know, in terms of pilots because of the MiG-21. But it's, it's also a misunderstood aircraft. Hello and welcome to the 30th episode of In Our Defense. Uh, it's been over a month uh, of the Indian election, since the Indian election results. And uh, you've had uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's first uh, foreign trip to Russia, uh, which is going to be a big focus area for us on this, on this episode. Hi Shiv, how are you? And uh, I'm, I'm well, Dev, how are you doing? And uh, very, very telling that the Prime Minister has made his first foreign yes. visit in his third tenure to Russia, yes. which is the subject of our podcast yeah. today, which is actually something we've been touching upon in yes. many of our episodes. But finally, we get to do a full chunky episode on yeah. just Russia because there's so much Russia in our defense. So <laughs> that's a talking good, all that's, about it today. That's a good phrase, by yeah. the way. So much Russia in our defense. In our defense, yeah. <laughs> right. And I think you're right because I think you've been itching to talk about Russia because you've given us glimpses of your frustrations uh, and at times your anger with uh, the overly dependent, uh, over, over dependence that India yeah. has sometimes shown uh, in its history uh, towards Russian equipment, military equipment. So we'll uh, keep this episode since it's in our defense uh, focus mostly on the military side of things because we don't want to talk too much geopolitics but that is involved obviously yeah. this tri trip also assumes significance because this is the first time PM Modi has visited Russia since the beginning of the Ukraine war correct yeah uh, the west some people in the west were not too happy to see PM Modi over there and especially the sort of you know camaraderie that you saw with between Putin and, and PM Modi oh, the full fledged uh, meltdown in yeah. the west and <laughs> Zelensky too was uh, very very <laughs> yeah. pissed his, yeah. his tweet uh, was you know quite scathing uh, but I think he had to say that yeah though. he of, yeah. of course had to say that uh, so while we might end up touching upon all these because this is obviously linked to the militaries at at, at, at larger level but we'll try to keep that at a minimum yeah but let's start with that actually uh sort of the boring sort of a laying ground for this episode because call me you know like it's a very uh maybe a foolish way to put it but don't you think that this uh this this idea of non-aligned movement that i've been taught in my school that was hyped up uh, so much that you know india was this harbinger of this, yeah. uh, these countries together you know not advocating for aligning with either the us or the soviet russia during the cold war uh nehru sort of led this movement etc etc that this whole idea that we've been taught in school is sort of a misnomer because if you actually see what played out in the real world you had india kind of aligning with Russia. Not a, I'm not saying in terms of, let's say that India was supporting Russia or uh, Soviet Russia against the US, but more so they become quite pally. Uh, you, I think there were several factors behind it, which I want you to kind of give us a, a big over, over, uh, overview of that, you know, US was signed, signed, sort of becoming friendly with Pakistan. You had the Soviet Russia invading Afghanistan. So you also obviously uh, want to counter that because the US back then was very, very, very anti-communist and they wanted to ensure that Soviet Russia could be countered in all spheres as far as possible. So tell me about this, this sort of 
clash I see in front of me when I remember my history textbook, where, which talked about non-land movement. And then you do this uh, podcast with you where day after day we talk about the so much dependence that India had on Russia. So, you know, I think you're right when you say that uh, the, the so-called non-aligned movement, and I'll tell you why I call it so-called, is because it was a, uh, you know, the non-aligned movement was non-aligned relative to uh, you know, other geopolitical moves of that of that time. You know, like you rightly said, Dev, uh, the non-aligned movement, you know, one of the uh, leading features of the non-aligned movement was a very pronounced alignment. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the, the fact that the world was uh, uh, being cleaved into by the Cold War, uh, you know, into the, the free world versus the communist world, uh, you know, was pretty plain to see. And I think uh, uh, one thing that I actually find quite uh, amusing and a little distasteful is the way in which many analysts look back on that time and judge the decisions taken by, uh, you know, Nehru and the others as far as India's geopolitical choices are concerned. But uh, if you actually look at it very closely, uh, uh, given given the China factor, given the growing growing power of China at that time, given that the United States was nothing like the united states we know of it now uh, it was a it was a highly unreliable uh, un, uh, you know a, a, a country not worthy of trust uh, kind of country uh, it was it was difficult for india to align with any country other than uh, the soviet union mm -hmm. the ussr uh, and therefore it was it was in the in the 50s 60s 70s that that relationship really really grew organically in many ways uh, and we'll get into the you know, we'll get into the imbalance of the relationship uh, as we get into the meat of this episode. Uh, but I think the India Russia relationship uh, has has endured. It's it's not it's not a it's not a uh, you know a relationship that is all you know all uh, unicorns and candy. It's it's a it's a relationship that is replete with issues. It's a it's a, it's a relationship replete with the uh, potholes. It's a relationship that is replete, re replete with ups and downs, but it is a relationship that has endured. Mm. It has never had, uh, uh, you know, the one thing that one can say about the India-Russia relationship that you can almost not say for any other relationship is, it has never come to a breaking point. Mm. Interesting. The India-Russia relationship has endured across administrations, across governments, across uh, leanings, across, uh, you know, the UPA government, the NDA government, whatever it was, the continuity as far as India, Russia, friendship and relationships uh, are concerned has has had an unusual level of endurance. If you look at the uh, India-US relationship, it's had ups and downs, it's had breaking points. It, you know, right now it's going through a particularly troubled phase. Uh, you know, you're getting a lot of heat from the West because of the Russia factor. But that again has just emphasized the fact that India-Russia has managed to weather many a geopolitical storm. Uh, and I think uh, the fact that Modi chose to go to Russia as his first visit post, uh, you know, post the, uh, as prime minister for the third mm. time, post the Ukraine war, post the pandemic, etc., cetera, uh, is, a, is a huge message, huge message to the world. And the fact that that summit happened yesterday on the same day that the NATO summit was taking place yes. in, in Washington, uh, that may not have been of Modi's choosing. That may have been a coincidence. But I, I'm just saying that uh, I, uh, in India and Russia have had numerous summits. This was the 22nd mm -hmm. friendship summit of the two countries. But I can't think of a single summit in the past that has had the kind of immediate global shockwaves mm -hmm. and the kind of uh, overt, you know, very specific Western interest uh, ever before. So it's 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 really, really telling that Modi chose to go to Russia. Yeah, and in fact, I think yesterday uh, in the in, in, his, in his statements uh, when Putin was sitting next to him, I think uh, PM Modi did refer to that as well. Yeah, that uh, many world powers. I think if I'm not wrong, he specifically mentioned Western world powers are looking at this meeting and you know waiting to see what the yeah. outcome. And and Putin meeting. said that the West is looking jealously yes, at this meeting. Yes, <laughs> yes. So uh, right, he knows how to push <laughs> their buttons. <laughs> uh, right, uh, and a very good point that you made over there about the imbalance between uh, the our relationship because. Uh, 
uh, and we'll obviously circle back to that later. But I remember reading this piece just before PM, the PM's visit to Russia, where I forgot the exact number, but the trade de- the trade imbalance between India and Russia is huge. Yeah. Like you know, we just it, it's basically we import stuff and Russia doesn't really take anything from us. Uh, Rumbos being the prime example, mm-hmm. I think in previous episode we've discussed. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll get to that. Uh, but before we do, uh, let's talk now about the. Uh, our favorite subject, the Russian equipment, yeah. Russian equipment in in in, a, in our inventory. Uh, I did a quick check of what I think is right now in the Indian inventory. So you have the Suit 30, you have the MiG 29, you have the MiG 21, MiG 27. I'm not sure if it's MiG 27 is retired. Is retired. Yeah. yeah. You have the Mi 17. You have a helicopter that's known as the Camo of KA 31. And you 28. You have one more Mi uh, helicopter. Yeah. You have the T 90 tank. You have the T 72 tank. You have INS Vikramaditya. You have a Kilo class fleet of submarines. You have the INS Chakra. You had it. I think you don't have it. It's right it's gone back. Now. It's gone yeah. back. But there is some talk that INS Chakra two might yes, might come. That's right. Uh, you have the S400 recently yeah. purchased. Uh, you have something known as the BM30 Smooch. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a line of SAM systems. Uh, you have the AK203 bought off the shelf and also being produced near Ramethi now. I love the smile on your face. <laughs> uh, and you have the Brahmos. Favorite but, subject. Yeah, yeah, and if the Brahmos. But I think Brahmos is, like we discussed in that episode, I think more Indian than Russian because, you know, developed here together. Yeah, Even though literally. developed together, but yeah. anyway, you get my point. We've talked about the dependence. We'll obviously explore that a bit more as well. And India trying to be in off, uh, especially in the context of the Ukraine war. But first, I want to talk about quality. Uh, this is something you've briefly touched upon, and I think you've been itching to talk about it. Correct me if I can take this analogy. Is it like a case of, you know, Japanese uh, car or technology versus German car engineering? So, you know, you have, if you were to co- compare uh, Russia versus NATO or Western equipment, so, you know, Russian, like the Japanese, is rugged, cheaper, easy to maintain, etc. But not as high-tech, as modern, as German car engineering. Would that be a very crude analogy, or would you? I, I, I I'll try and make it even more specific because you know that would that would uh, that analogy would somehow make it seem like the Japanese equipment doesn't really you know lean into ergonomics and things like that. Let me explain it a little bit more specifically. Russian equipment, uh, you know, there there are there are exceptions to everything, but the general uh, reputation that Russian repu- uh, equipment, military equipment, weapons, etc., has is that they are uh, robustly functional cheap to produce, quick to produce, are uh, very adaptable to different environments, uh, are not particularly focused on the comfort uh, of the operator, uh, require very frequent maintenance and spares. uh, So the ownership cost is high. Uh, the, The cost of acquisition of Russian equipment at the time you're paying for it is low compared to Western mm. equipment. But the life cycle cost, which is actually a better measure of, uh, you know, the ownership cost of a weapon system is actually high because of the number of times you need to maintain, overhaul, service, repair uh, Russian equipment is is a is many degrees higher than comparable Western equipment. Uh, so availability, serviceability issues are there. In terms of, in terms of quality, uh, quality is, uh, again, an issue because of maintainability. Now, this this has become a bit of an emotive issue because uh, w- when you look at uh, weapons and equipment, uh, again, there are, you know, there are polarities. There are people who say, uh, you know, if it can get the job done, then yeah. why are we sitting here and talking about quality and things like that? Uh, well, because it goes to the heart of being able to wage uh, mm. war and, uh, you know, and actually... Uh, uh, you know, uh, conduct offensive operations uh, because it's not just about what equipment can do, but how available it is to you. If it's going to be sitting at an airbase for seven days to be maintained and overhauled and the weapon and the uh, engine to be serviced, uh, what use is its amazing offensive capabilities, right? That's just an example. So uh, the Russian equipment is low on that. It's bad in terms of serviceability, availability, it's a it's a greater much more needs to be done to keep those equipment in ship shape and in working condition. Number two, uh, uh, Russian contracts by their nature, and this has been a historical issue right through, is these contracts are cheap at the signing point, mm. but there are hidden costs, uh, which the Russians will surprise you with later. Gotcha. You know, if you want additional stuff separate contract uh, you want uh, you want to repair this 
okay, but let's sign a larger repair contract which will take care of all these things. Oh wow! Uh, you know, I, I I'm I'm obviously sim- uh, saying it simplistically now, but this has been how it has been over the decades. Now things have vastly improved because Russia has realized that India is not playing around. They've got other sources of equipment like France and the United States, and they've put their money where their mouth is. So so basically, uh, uh, Russia ha- has always looked at India as. Uh, you know, also a reliable partner. It's a symbiotic relationship. But let's not forget that in many ways, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, Russia has also seen India as a cash cow. In You know, India is a country with, uh, uh, you know, surrounded by conflict, surrounded by quote-unquote enemies and problems, you know, Pakistan, China, etc. And therefore, it's, it's it had an appetite for military hardware. Uh, at the same time, it had a complete lack of a domestic industrial base uh, to feed its military with modern or reasonably modern weapons. So Russia filled that huge void and how. 50s, 60s and 70s, it poured. I mean, of course, there was equipment from other places also, but starting from the 60s, really, with the MiG-21s onward, uh, and even before that, Russian equipment basically sort of poured into India at a time when, uh, you know, few other countries were willing to actually do that. France was one of those countries, of course, the UK, but there was no American equipment. And therefore... Russian equipment, which was cheap, easily available. You know, there were no nakras in terms of export licensing and things that some of these other countries had. Russia was basically, you know, it's the money, honey. You know, if you can pay the money, show some money up front, the weapon is yours. Wow. They are they are brutally transactional and they still are, by the way. You know, unlike, uh, unlike other countries like the United States, I mean, it's unfair to compare the US and Russia uh, when, it, when it comes to selling of weapons. In terms of the United States and the kind of protocols they go through in order to export weapons, even to a country like India, which is an ally, is 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 crazy compared to how Russia exports weapons. Russia is like, paisa hai, le lo, maal utha lo. It's it's literally like that. I have met contractors. I have met middlemen. I have met agents. I've I've seen the dark underbelly of the contracting system, and I can tell you that it's as simple as that. Wow. Russia, when it comes to a country like India, I'm not saying to anyone, but I'm saying to a country like India, it's about the money. In many cases, India has funded those projects in Russia and then been a customer. Su-30 MKI is a yes. prime example. The MiG-21 upgrade is a prime example. The Brahmos is a prime example. <laughs> so, so absolutely. Uh, Russia has benefited very, very richly from India's appetite for military hardware. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, slightly tangential uh, extension of that previous previous question uh, about uh, the uh, the quality of equipment. Uh, because when I was researching, I just like, you know, recalled something that Abhishek Bhalla had mentioned in season one of Aina Defense. And this was, I think, when he was reporting from uh, from uh, from Ukraine during the initial few uh, weeks or months uh, of the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, things have definitely changed. In hindsight, uh, you know, you uh, will have a bit more and a lot more clarity on what I'm about to ask you. Uh, but we were talking about the failure or what it seemed to be back then, the failure of the Russian tanks. Uh, he recalled seeing uh, roads after roads lined up with Russian tanks because of what he told me back then was a not defect per se, but like a flaw in the engineering of the, I forgot which uh, which tank it was. But basically what he said was that the munition of the tank was kept under the turret, mm. which made it sort of a very easy for Ukrainian uh, uh, Ukrainian just to, to strike because of which you had all these tanks failing. Uh, then you had, like we've discussed previously in, a, in, a, in another episode, but you know, you had a, you had different thoughts on that, that the, the Air Force was missing, leading to a lot of questions, a lot of suspicion about whether the Russians were not confident of their Air Force. And I remember asking you back then as well, then wouldn't that have sparked some worries in India considering like a large part of your Air Force is, is Russian? So when you talk about the tanks as well, uh, you know, with, with respect to the Ukraine-Russia uh, war, do you think that that war has kind of exposed some, if not all, of Russia's equipment's quality? So, so, so look, it, it, it didn't take the Ukraine war to to teach the Indian military about the quality of Russian equipment, okay? Uh, India has been uh, saddled, uh, that's a rude word. India has operated Russian equipment for a long time and 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 look, it, nobody's, no, nobody should even for a moment sit and say that this is crappy, mm. crappy stuff. Russian equipment is good equipment. It has, it has been part of our wars. 
we've fought wars with Russian equipment, we've won wars with Russian equipment. Uh, uh, Russian equipment continues to be the mainstay of our Indian military. You were talking about tanks, uh, the overwhelming, actually almost our entire armored force is of Russian origin. The T-90 tanks, before that the T-72 tanks, before that we had, had uh, you know, other tanks of British origin, etc. Uh, but uh, the, the fact that the Indian Arjun tank, you know, never really managed to uh, find favor with the Indian army. That's a se- that's a whole new episode which we will do. Believe me, uh, you know because uh, because that paints India in a very bad picture. Uh, is the fact that uh, Russian equipment almost entirely dominates your armored force. Uh, uh, the the BMPs, you know, the infantry carriers, those are of uh, Soviet origin as well. Uh, so so uh, you've got a situation where uh, your entire tank strength is of you know Soviet slash Russian. Vintage. Sure, you're building those tanks here in India, but ultimately the message as far as industry is concerned is something as as apparently rudimentary as a tank still needs to be of Soviet vintage technology. They're still building those tanks, mind you, in India. They're still building them. Uh, so, so the fact that Russia has a hold not only on advanced equipment like S-400s and you know, uh, surface-to-air missile systems and uh, nuclear submarines and things yes. like that. But also things as basic as tanks and infantry carriers and, you know, you know, your nuts and bolts of your military just is just a sad tale. We're still operating our MiG-21s. And, you know, again, a- apart from the Arjun, we will do a MiG-21 special as well because the MiG-21 is now finally, thankfully, in its final final mm, stretch. Yes. Uh, you know, another uh, another squadron is going to be retiring very soon. They've served amazingly through their time. But uh, each one of these things is a reminder of the kind of octopus-like grip hmm. Russian equipment has with the Indian military. Everywhere you look, there is Russian equipment. From the smallest thing to the biggest thing, from, from a bullet, hmm. ammunition, to a firearm built in Amethi, like you said, all the way to INS Vikramaditya. And uh, it's it's it, it's fascinating. And uh, for all the you know twenty plus billion dollars worth of contracts that the United States has done, you know since two thousand seven two thousand eight, it's still not a not a scratch on the kind of hold that Russia still mm-hmm. has on the Indian arsenal. Yeah, uh, but then why is that so? Uh, and more than you know, just t- sitting here and talking about the past and talking about this went wrong, that went wrong. Obviously, we will uh, you we can uh, talk a bit about that. But one, why is that so? Uh, how did we reach it in the first place? Like the laundry list of equipment that I read out. Why are we there? I love that you mentioned uh, uh, AK two zero three. Yeah. You've bought them off shelf from Russia, a big batch, and now you're going to be co-producing them in a factory in a way. This was supposed to happen a couple of years earlier. But I think the Ukraine war kind of kind of delayed, delayed that. So that for me, when researching the episode, was the best example of the sort of equipment for which you don't need Russia anymore. I mean, I'm pretty sure you can do a rifle on your own. But again, rifle is a separate topic and we've been mentioning that for a while. So we'll do that very soon. But yeah, to, uh, to the larger question, how did we end up reaching? You've kind of briefly explored that by talking about how even though you had France willing to give you equipment, but you know, you had this sort of international uh, geopolitics playing out with US, uh, West, etc., China. So you kind of had India going towards towards Russia's side. But apart from just how we ended up reaching here, what do you think now are the challenges to get to wean ourselves off Russian equipment? Because India is seriously considering that with various making India programs like we've seen, we've bought uh, jets from from France we we are uh, signing many deals with the US uh, i'm guessing one reason is also the ukraine wall sort of made india realize that so much dependency on russia especially for what happens after you buy equipment with respect to maintenance and spares is going to going to be dangerous for yeah. your, for your military so that and what are the other challenges that people like me, people like, you know, who watch in our defense don't know that India faces when it yeah. comes to kind of going off Russian equipment? So, so uh, there's a three-pronged answer to that. First of all, let's be very clear. There is, there is no weaning off Russian equipment. Mm. We live in a world where Russia happens to be our most trusted ally. And, uh, and to very quickly segue and answer your question as to how did we reach here, let's remember that this is not like India is this damsel in the forest with no choice but to buy Russian equipment. It's not like that. It's These things are much more complicated. The reason India has chosen to buy Russian equipment 
repeatedly and has therefore resulted in this hugely uh, you know uh, russia colored military is because india has seen russia as a reliable supplier hmm. a supplier who will not pull the plug during war a supplier who can be relied upon not to you know throw uh, you know rules or protocols or geopolitical compulsions in your face when push comes to shove when the balloon goes up when war breaks out and you cannot put a price on that that is something that india values very highly because this is a country that has fought a number of wars and it sees reliability during war as as having no price mm. you know you cannot put a price on that we live in a country where after we conducted nuclear tests the united states pulled the plug yes. on diplomatic relations practically killing many defense projects in the water including the tejas which we've spoken yes. about before uh it conduct it, it the, the kind of body blow that had on many different military hardware projects uh is something that is still being written about and it's one of the reasons why india is still in some ways suspicious of the united states it's one of the reasons why india still insists on indian equipment even on american products it's one of the reasons why india still doesn't go the whole hog in terms of uh you know uh, uh jointness and uh, uh commonality agreements with the united states even though the world has changed india is much closer to the united states now uh vastly different from the years gone by but even now that kind of the kind of faith that india has in russia and vice versa mm. in terms of this kind of thing is is a uh, you know it's difficult to it's difficult to convey how 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 much value india attaches to that so it's not like you know we've arrived here because we had no choice mm. and things like that but to answer your question weaning away from this is going to be like a three pronged thing a it's never going to be fully weaned away from because we are still buying russian equipment we still have collaborative uh you know agreements with russia to co produce stuff brahmos being one example and brahmos has a long future uh, there are many more things india and russia are doing together the follow on to the s400 may be something that india and russia might actually do in a collaborative way uh, so russia is never going to be sort of expunged from the indian military it's always going to be part of the indian military but reducing dependence which is a word which you very correctly used uh, dev is something that india recognized the need for long before the ukraine war mm. long before the ukraine war what was the mmrca what was india's contest to get new fighter jets all about it was in recognition of the fact that look we have an air force that is saddled with uh, russian fighter jets we've got over 200 sukhois we've got you know over 100 mig 29s we've got all these uh, you know other mig 23s mig 27s mig 21s you know in our inventory we need our next generation of fighters to be western mm -hmm. more reliable you know 3 4 times as expensive as russian jets but you know you get what you paid for that kind of thing russia the rafal for instance is exorbitantly more expensive than uh, you know any comparable jet uh, in russia russia has always uh, uh, played on cost you know we, you know we give you bang for your buck cheaper etc but in the last 15 20 years has woken up to the idea that western equipment is better quality uh, and the and and the, the the monetary value that you're attaching to that actually means something if you're paying more for something it's probably of better quality is not not a, not the best way to see defense equipment but in this case it actually is true yep. uh and so the the ukraine war you know so many people and i've and i've heard analysts talk over and over again of how how ukraine war is a wake up call because of the ukraine war india now should uh, hedge its uh, risk and stop uh, buying from russia india started that process a long time ago my friend Ukraine war was uh, Ukraine war can't take the credit for India's need to reduce dependence on Russia mm. that has been happening for a long time if that had not been happening for a long time India would not buy C17 jets from the United States India would not buy P8I aircraft for its navy from the United States India would not buy Chinook helicopters from the United States as opposed to Russian India would not buy Apache helicopters uh from 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 uh, from uh the united states as opposed to russian equipment uh india would not be looking at uh, you know uh, harpoon missiles from the united states instead of comparable russian equipment uh these things would not happen if india was not taking a concerted decision 
to spread its defense equipment mm. sources as a rising power it could no longer be seen as being heavily dependent on russia that's why it's got the rafales from france it's big ticket you know combat aircraft acquisition is from france mm. not not from russia not from the united states from france very interesting because it is investing geopolitical capital in europe as well and basically signaling to both russia and the united states that we are independent we are not going to throw big contracts your way because you think that we attach geopolitical value only to both of you we mm. attach it also to a country like france which represents europe so the shift that has taken place of india weaning itself away from russia began i would say a good two decades before the ukraine war and it will continue and russia recognizes that mm. that's the reason why russia has also pro professionalized in a very big way now they realize that boss it, it can't be any more no more of the you know cash and carry weapon culture with india that that era is gone now you have a country that is a giving very big contracts which russia earlier felt should have come to it mm. are going to countries like france and the united states b india is for the first time in its history very seriously building domestic industry yes. very very seriously for the first time no more no more naam ke waste projects here and there now real stuff is happening tata is building the c295 they building the apache fuselages in hyderabad other things are going to happen right now so domestic industry is coming up in a very big way and with india's uh, you know uh, startup startup ecosystem getting into ai and drones we won't even we won't need the cutting edge of future battlefield from abroad we'll have it right here so that 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 entire curve has come full circle now and russia is going to feel the pinch because they don't have that yes and india is not the country anymore that will fund russian projects we can just fund our own so that that's that's where things are at right now uh, right uh, glad you give us that very vivid and like sort of a longish but you know very so give us a very extensive uh, answer answer to that because i think that really answers a lot of uh, questions that i had in my mind uh, we'll talk uh, a bit now about the imbalance that we spoke about earlier uh, uh, something that we spoken about in the past uh, that how uh, much of friend russia really has been to yeah. india but after a quick break then you can start with some kind of strength training or body weight exercises yes yeah. so that is something that a lot of women want to stay away from because yeah. um strength training means you're going to get really bulky really muscular you know i don't want to look like he man i just mm -hmm. want to look fit yeah is that true and why is it important particularly for women mm -hmm. to consider strength training see when i started my journey i thought zumba and aerobics or probably outdoor walk mm. that's all is the female fitness regime regime yeah yeah i mean i i think we both have grown up yeah. listening to this looking at such videos mm. but um strength training is so essential especially women after their 30s and even before because your body is mm. changing hormonally during the peri and pre menopause mm -hmm. stage or your after menopause also naturally you're going to lose your muscle with age we lose muscle with age our bone density goes down so when you do strength training you're going to strength you are preparing your body for all those changes mm. that's that's inevitable that's going to happen it's so essential for every woman to work out with weights because you will maintain your muscle mass you're not going to get bulky because we don't have that much of testosterone in our body why men get bulky when they go to gym is because they have a testosterone that's their main hormone right. women do not have that much of testosterone so you will only get smaller stronger and you will have an amazing toned body mm. with more and more weights you're never going to get bulky you know when you see those women mm. athletes you mm. get this idea oh my god but you have to understand they are professionals yeah. they're supposed to look like that so they have a very different kind of a regime and a nutrition uh, plan and and all sorts of things So they're professional bodybuilders. Welcome back. Shivan and I are discussing uh, Russia and India's long-standing partnership with Russia, 50, 60, or uh, more than more than that actually years. Uh, against the backdrop of PM Narendra Modi going to Moscow this week, uh, his first visit, his first foreign tour after taking oath for the third time in India, uh, very significant. We'll talk now about 
uh, how uh, Russia has always been perceived and seen uh, as India's friend. Uh, rightfully so in many parts. Uh, Shiv, you know, before the break gave us like a very real answer of how Russia has actually stood by India when it mattered the most. Uh, has, unlike the other countries, not pulled the plug uh, on, on, on a defense contract or whatever uh, at, at times of war. In fact, during the 71 war, uh, Russia famously sent a fleet of ships towards the Indian Ocean. I'm not sure if they reached the Indian Ocean over... Uh, intel inputs that India had received that the UK and the US were planning on sending, I think, at least one aircraft carrier in the region when India yeah. uh, was at full-fledged war uh, with, with, with Pakistan. Uh, so I think India had requested and invoked some treaty that it had with, with, with Russia to, you know, ask them to send a, send a fleet of ships uh, and they, they did so. But, you know, I... I is it always just because of the goodness of it of its heart? Because you know you also in a previous episode talked about the Su thirty and the MiG twenty nine K, the naval variant, and how it wasn't something that India or Indian the military of India wanted in the first place. Though you were you did mention that 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 does not make it bad equipment, but that just tells you something about the way such negotiations are done yeah. when it comes to defense contracts and military contracts, especially between Russia and India. Uh, you also have the fact that Vikram Aditya, even though it's a good aircraft carrier, is not brand new. It was second hand when India bought it. Though, and when it comes to military equipment, I'm pretty sure second hand also has, you know, great quality because it is completely refurbished, uh, yeah. if I'm not wrong. Uh, but my, you get my larger question because you've said that there are no free lunches in the world. So Russia has been the steadfast partner, good ally, you know, has been there for us, etc., etc., has signed these deals for us. Some of the deals you've, uh, when you've described, you know, there was some sort of shadiness involved, like with the Su-30 and the MiG-29K. Uh, some seem pretty, pretty good. So this and then sort of, you know, throws this picture, like I don't really understand this relationship then and and like the, the balance between the two sides. Uh, so can you like define this has russia been a good friend only for from the goodness of its heart or or or, or, or is there something more to it no obviously not it's a, no relationship uh, is out of the goodness of anyone's heart there's no altruism in diplomacy uh, this this holds true for every single relationship uh, including the uh, the us israel relationship which people say is out of the goodness of hearts and things like that it's not uh, all countries uh, act in self interest all countries see benefit in bilateral relationships. Uh, and uh, the India-Russia relationship has by no means been a one-way relationship. Uh, you know, Russia has gained hugely and part of it is reflective in the continuing trade imbalance as well. Uh, you know, from doing, doing business and having this very sustained relationship with India. But like I said, and I repeat, having a reliable strategic partner uh, is not something you can quantify or put a price tag on. Mm -hmm. That, for, you know, for a country like India, newly independent, uh, you know, just after the world war, uh, you know, with all these uncertainties before it, a young country, having a steadfast uh, a superpower, mm. Russia, is Soviet Union is a superpower, yes. uh, as your, uh, you know, by your side in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, strategic requirements, equipment, even even guidance, etc., is not something you can put a price tag on. And, I, and, and uh, th that's the reason why uh, you know, when you say that, uh, you know, this is a one-way relationship or India has not gained as much, you have to recognize the amount of value India attaches to having that level of reliability, which is, which is, which is disconnected from the fact that India is paying for that reliability. <laughs> yes. It's not free. That reliability is being paid for and then some. But it's still reliability. It is still reliability. It's, it's the kind of reliability transactional reliability that you can trust. Mm. It's the kind of reliability where you're not going to spend, uh, you're not going to have geopolitical insomnia over whether you're going to wake up the next day and see that country change its mind over, mm. over certain commitments. You cannot put a price tag on that. And I've, now I've used the word price tag about 17 <laughs> times in this answer. So I will go to the next point, which is that, which is that India has, uh, 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 the, the fact that India is also seen, you know, we are, we are so, since we're sitting in India and talking about the relationship, we're so focused on how, how India sees Russia, a reliable partner. Let's, for a moment, imagine that you and I are sitting in Moscow and I hope one of these episodes, I hope Anna funds our next episode yes. in Moscow, maybe at some point, uh, is that, uh, is that, look at how Russia sees India. Mm. Russia sees India as a, 
as an absolute bulwark of a partner mm. reliable dependable respected globally seen as an oasis of democracy uh uh you know a country that has a huge market so it's economically beneficial hungry for energy as, as uh, rep rep represented in all the oil deals and it makes russia look good yes very important please never forget these 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 uh, intangibles that people don't talk about putin looks great hugging modi putin looks fabulous putting that saint andrews mala on modi it validates russia it it has validate everyone in the past of the russian leadership doing business with india because india is a credible country that is seen as a responsible democratic power russia is not so india has validated russia geopolitically and strategically if india can be such good friends with russia then russia can't be so bad you get what i'm saying yes so so all all of these th this this kind of uh uh intangible benefit that russia has gained from india on the strategic sphere geopolitically speaking in international forums its ability to you know do business with other countries in europe etc is of massive value to 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 russia huge for a country that i mean just look at how russia russia has looked at right now mm. let's take forget the past forget forget history forget what has happened in the past look at how things let's talk about just the last 48 hours dev vladimir putin is perhaps the most globally reviled leader and when i say globally reviled i mean forget forget india forget china everywhere else he is practically reviled because he's seen as a country that is attacked ukraine he's invaded ukraine he's he's brandished his nuclear weapons he's threatened world peace nato hates him most of africa is like wondering what the hell is going on in the middle east some countries like him some think that he's unreliable israel hates him uh, uh, you know southeast asia basically goes with what uh, you know the west thinks as far as russia is concerned so he's he uh, the west is trying to make putin out to be this international pariah globally mm. isolated you know almost on the lines of a kim jong un they want him to the world to see him as a kim jong un powerful isolated unpredictable unreliable and dangerous and someone who nobody should do business with and then the prime minister of the world's largest democracy goes and hugs him at that time he's hugged him before let's not forget western hypocrisy here modi has hugged putin many times before he's gone on boat rides with him he's gone to his farm all that bromance has happened but to hug him now when the west is trying to make putin out to be a kim jong un is 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 in excruciating and aggravating for the west but see the value for russia which is why when 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 modi gets that order of saint andrews the highest honor in russia the benefit is not for modi the benefit is for vladimir putin putin is validating himself by giving the leader of the world's largest democracy russia's highest honor hmm. russia is gaining from this so so this is this is russia sees great benefit from this relationship beyond the paisa for weapons and mm -hmm. things like that and india sees a reliable partner it's a many people will say will see this as a an imbalanced relationship a complicated relationship no relationship is not complicated mm -hmm. there will be places where india needs to do much more to equalize what it's getting from russia long way to go as far as that is concerned but these two things i've mentioned show that even during the biggest upheaval of our time probably israel gaza ukraine mm. russia this relationship has actually endured and and it goes beyond sukhois and migs and tanks and things like that believe me yeah i think that's a very uh, that's a brilliant answer because it also answers some of the questions that i've been having since i saw the visuals of the, the prime minister's meeting with president putin uh just thinking about how it turned out to be a much grander affair than what people initially thought it would be Uh, the fact that you had Russia sending, I think, the first deputy prime minister to 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 see Modi at the airport to, to yeah. pick up Modi uh, to meet Modi at the airport when he arrived arrived there, uh, which was a grade higher than whom they sent for to meet President uh, Xi Jinping from China mm -hmm. when he was there. That said something. 
so instead of asking about uh, how you saw the meeting because you've more or less answered how you saw the meeting i'll then talk about the one thing that a few people have been talking about some on social media a few geopolitical ex- experts have also uh, written about or about about it and it mm. holds a very sig- a significant military value for india is the china connection we won't you know spend a long uh, answer on it but there have been growing talks there has been growing murmurs of russia china getting closer you've uh, given us this very good example of how over the 50 60 70 years of a relationship russia has been steadfastly with us you mentioned how in times of war and conflict it has been with us our wars and conflicts so far have been with pakistan yeah. now if i hope they don't happen but if they happen they are most definitely going to be with china there's already been hype the standoff has been there for 3 4 years you've had the kalban valley clash which was a full fledged physical conflict uh so any hypothetical war of the future india has 90% my guess is it would be with china uh so do you think this sort of uh relationship that russia has with india that it, it steadfastly stands with india would hold true even then or uh, or do you think that the people who are worried the people who were saying that pm modi needs to visit moscow to counter russia's growing uh, friendship with china just being you know you know being worried too soon and there's nothing that we should be seeing right now maybe we should wait for a, f- a couple of more look uh, uh, you know again it it's very tempting to look at dip, dip, uh, you know diplomacy and geopolitics in terms of binaries you know uh, you know if war breaks out between india and china will russia choose india or china you know if war breaks out between uh, uh, you know russia and the us will india choose russia or us it never works like that uh, take a take a take an even more immediate example of russia and ukraine hmm. you know we we don't even need to go into hypotheticals and philosophies because the beauty or the actually the terrible thing about our world is we've got live examples in front of us russia and ukraine is a live example of that india has close relations with both these countries Rem- please remember that ukraine used to be a part of ussr ukraine became a, dif- a separate country after the breakup of the ussr mm. and india has had close political economic cultural and strategic and military relations with both these countries separately mm. we've discussed this in the past yes. our antonov 32 aircraft the engines that power our warships many different kinds of uh, military electronics are manufactured in ukraine they are of ukrainian origin and uh, uh the the fact that russia and ukraine are at war has not for a moment meant that india has felt the need to take a side in fact india has exposed this western predilection of us versus them mm. demonstrate on whose side you are you know uh, commit to a cause by not visiting russia and all these myopic stupidities that the west is obsessed with because they can't they can't digest not having control over the rest of the world for them it is it is indigestible to see modi going and meeting putin Hmm. but modi also met zelensky just last month yes. on 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 june the 14th if i'm not mistaken at the g7 he met zelensky yes. and he uh, hugged him their first meeting after 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 a while but they've been speaking regularly so there is no there is no ye ya wo as far as india is concerned and india has completely exposed western hypocrisy vis-a-vis russia and ukraine by showing that india has a demonstrable active organic diplomatic relationship and dialogue with both these countries and and modi visiting russia does not mean that modi doesn't have a relationship with zelensky of course zelensky had uh, you know bitter things to say about the hug between modi and putin but what else is the guy going to say mm. on a day like that of course he's going to say it he has to say it because anyone meeting putin you know shows up zelensky so so i i don't think I don't think India has anything to prove as far as Russia is concerned. The examples are there right in front of it. India has made many missteps, many foreign policy mistakes. We can do a whole episode on what I think uh, you know are the mistakes that India has made especially in our neighborhood. But as far as Russia and Ukraine is concerned, I think that stands and speaks for itself in terms of how to uh, handle a situation where you are friends with two countries yes. who are at war. the only country the only country and the only leader to stand face to face with putin and say 
the solution is not on the battlefield yes. who else has done that yes. and 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 please this is not about narendra modi this is about the office of the indian prime minister forget forget about whether it's modi or manmohan whoever it is an indian prime minister has stood in front of putin and said the solution is not on the battlefield war is not an option in his face yes okay and you've got the west melting down saying are why are you hugging why are you signing deals why is that is the truth of the india russia relationship the ability to look russia in the eye and say these things yeah uh, in fact i think we've mentioned this once before uh, that uh, the russia ukraine war the entire episode has i think been the is is a great example of indian diplomacy being at its finest yeah. uh cuz even at the during pm modi's meeting uh, with putin uh, this week uh i don't know if many people noticed it but there was a reference to children dying in 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 ukraine that reference was worded very nicely yeah. it was not worded in, in reference to the ukraine war by the way it was worded in reference to conflicts and uh, terrorist attacks but it came a day after ukraine accused russia of bombing a children's hospital and killing a few children and an attack russia has denied so obviously india could not have made a straight reference to it however i was quite quite shocked to hear him say it live to, 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 for him to say it but putin was sitting right next to him that was quite something so that that i think gives you an example of how diplomacy in india was, was working right now right as we end this episode uh, we'll just go back to sort of a nerdy uh, moment because we've spent a large part of this episode talking about russian equipment one a personal question for you what is your favorite absolute favorite russian piece of equipment that is there perhaps in the military or perhaps it's not in, it's there somewhere else and second uh you must you you must have met several generations of officers you know who operated all these russian uh, piece of russian equipment you must have also met the newer bunch who are now being exposed to some western equipment that we have freshly inducted or maybe you know they've uh, come across at you know uh, joint exercises and stuff like yeah. that uh and this is just a personal question for them as well i'm not asking in terms of because obviously we've discussed this the officers or the even the high, senior officers they don't decide matters of military deals that's a yeah. decision taken by the indian government so i'm not talking about geopolitics over i'm talking about their, their personal favorites they must be like yaar mujhe bhi na wo plane udana hai mujhe na wo bandook chahiye that looks so sexy yeah, do they yeah. have these preferences so so my favorite and uh, you know it's a controversial choice but i'll qualify it my favorite is the mig 21 ah uh, because uh, uh, you know it's an aircraft that has uh, you know that that Uh, triggers emotions in people because of the associations with it whether it is uh, you know rangde basanti mm-hmm. or the abhijit gadgil case and many many tragic losses that india has suffered uh, I- I- you know in terms of pilots because of the mig 21 uh, but it's it's also a misunderstood aircraft because this is an aircraft that was operated in such large numbers and with so many flights every day that the the rate of accidents was okay. good point was was uh, you know uh, commensurate with the amount it was being used and the numbers which were actually being operated so in terms of accident rate uh, many of our listeners and viewers would be perhaps shocked to know that the mig 21 wasn't actually india's unsafest aircraft mm. it was actually the mig 23 slash mig 27 that was many degrees more unsafe in terms of accident rate commensurate with the number of aircraft that you had Uh, so the mig 21 was called the flying coffin and the widow maker and you know all these all these horrible horrible things which has given it a kind of sticky reputation as an unsafe aircraft wo service mein abhi bhi kyon hai usko hata do retire kar do and and you know a part of it is not unreasonable the the the, the mig 21 is a is an old piece of equipment that doesn't belong in any modern air mm. force but it's not like the mig 21 has remained in the force because someone loves it or because of sentimental reasons or because of uh, you know some uh, you know some intangible emotion in somebody's head it's not that the air force has a very difficult job to do in terms of maintaining numbers uh, the other the other point is that the mig 21 after it was upgraded was actually transformed into a really formidable uh you know uh, uh, fr- frontline interceptor aircraft yes the bison uh, we saw it we uh, you know the, the the mig 21 bison with the kind of intercept radar that it has uh, you know the kind of equipment that it has actually became a you know a you know a fighter aircraft that you wouldn't want to go up against because you can barely see it in a in a you know in a visual environment uh, it had beyond visual range weapons 
uh, very very agile etc so we we saw what happened with the uh, abhinandan yes. etc i mean that's a completely controversial <laughs> issue you shot down but the very fact that the indian air force would send up a mig 21 in that kind of battle tells you everything about the faith that the indian air force has in that aircraft beautiful aircraft they retiring very soon i'm hoping to get a flight in one before it mm. before they finally you know fold up their wings but uh, yeah probably won't happen but yeah the mig 21 uh, is foreign pilots especially american and european pilots when they come for uh, joint exercises in india their biggest wish is that they get to fly wow. one of the indian aircraft not everyone else not every not every one of them gets a chance but some of them do so some of them do fly back seat in a sukhoi or a mig 29 uh, and uh, and for them it's a it's a rollicking mm. uh, big uh, moment for them and it's not it's 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 not novelty value it's not like are हमारे पास बहुत ही शानदार एयरक्राफ्ट हैं यार ये तो कुछ भी नहीं बट लेट मी डू इट जस्ट फॉर फन लाइक यू नो एट अम्यूजमेंट पार्क इट्स नॉट एट ऑल पायलट्स हैव यू नो यू एंड आई कैन टॉक डाउन एंड अप अबाउट एयरक्राफ्ट बट पायलट्स हैव वेरी वेरी यू नो आयन क्लैड रिस्पेक्ट फॉर वॉट दीज एयरक्राफ्ट कैन डू बिकॉज दीज आर दीज आर थिंग्स एट किल एंड देर इज अ रिस्पेक्ट फॉर military hardware you know you know we can go all boys with toys and nerd out and geek out about aircraft but for these men and women now uh, these are weapons that that destroy cities or destroy countries and therefore there's a huge amount of respect for russian equipment and i've had long conversations with american pilots about russian equipment and i had a conversation with one senior american pilot in kalekunda in, in west bengal during the one of the cope india exercises mm-hmm. india us exercises and and uh, he'd just flown in a sukhoi and he was like he was like this is better than anything i've ever flown he said i love i loved it you know and uh, and and i probed and i said you're just saying that because it was like novelty right because the cold war you know you're yeah. an old guy you're like a major general and you you've flown american fighters all your life probably been trained against russian fighters and now you're flying the enemy fighter yeah. he said all that is true but this is a fabulous aircraft mm. and i managed to do things in it that you know I'd only heard Sukhoi's could do in terms of maneuverability and things like that, and you know it's all true. The legend is true, and he had the sparkle in his eye and stuff. So that kind of thing is real. The the the, the level of interest and respect for Russian equipment, you know, despite all these differences that I've just described, hmm. is definitely there. Yeah, right. I think we'll end it there. A uh, fun episode once again. Fun chat. Uh, loved your last answer, and I think it's also an important one on a serious note because uh, how the way you described the technical fact of MiG twenty nines and the number of uh, aircraft you operated MiG twenty ones, yeah, sorry twenty one, sorry, and the subsequent crash rate is really important because I yeah I remember because I have grown up reading those headlines yeah. that you talked about. I've grown up uh, seeing those phrases, uh, and as a child I didn't understand them obviously, but then uh, I joined journalism and I was able to make yeah. sense. of it and then you know talk to a journalist like you make even greater sense of it uh, so thanks thanks for that answer thanks, and thanks for that episode a uh, fun chat thanks as always to our producer anna priyadarshini and to our listeners and viewers that's it for this week's defense dose for more tune in next week till then stay safe and do not cross any boundaries with your passport bye bye